All right. Um, uh, good morning, everyone, uh, or afternoon, depending upon what side of the pond you might be on. Uh, this is uh, Richard Ift, and I'm joined by Sherry Roulette and Jerry, Jeremy Pam, all of the Federal Insurance Office at Treasury. Uh, also on the line um, is Mike McCauley at uh, Veris uh, ISO, who is directing the collection and aggregation of the data through the portal operated by ISO. Um, as you know, this is a, a joint treasury uh, state insurer uh, data call. Uh, typically, Aaron Brandenburg of the NAIC, who manages this from their standpoint, uh, joins these webinars of, as well. He was unable to uh, join us today, so uh, I, I will be speaking a little bit about the sort of uh, joint federal state things that you should be doing. Um, I should note I'm not an expert on insur uh, state insurance reporting <laughs> requirements, and I know that alien surplus lines insurers do have potentially separate issues with the International Department of the NAIC, so I I'd certainly um, make sure you do what you need to do in that regard. Um, if you have any, well, uh, we're going to we're, we're going to end up running through all the forms, which you should uh, uh, see up on the screen. Any questions you have, you, you've all been muted. However, any questions you have, you can send them to us uh, through the, uh, the chat function in this uh, Zoom webinar. Uh, go ahead and send them to uh, Sherry Roulette. Uh, she will um, sort of field them as they come in, and we, we will either address them as they're made or uh, sort of address them at the end. Um, I should also note that uh, Mike, Mike McCauley's voice is not doing very well today. So while he's on the call, he is not going to be able to respond to questions. Uh, you can direct uh, chat messages directly to him as well. If there's something that you need to feel you need to address with ISO, I will give you a little bit of a status update from ISO's standpoint that uh, Mike provided me earlier today. Um, and then last but not least, as I um, I, I told all of you beforehand, we are recording this webinar. Uh, so once we're done on this, we will uh, save that and that will be basically loaded up on our website in the same place where currently the, uh, the access links to the webinars uh, are located. So if uh, you have any colleagues or you know of other insurers that, that couldn't be with us today, they, they can, um, or you enjoy it so much, you want to listen to it again, you can, uh, you should be able to access it there. Hopefully, uh, sometime next week. All right. To get so, started. I just, I, I just okay. wanted to point out also, Richard, that I have shared your contact information along with my contact information in the chat box, and I see that Mike McCauley has also shared his contact info for anyone who may have questions concerning the content after the presentation ends. Great. Okay, well then I, I, I will not do that when I get to later on. So great, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you need to contact any of us offline individually, uh, again, please feel free to do so using the contact information in the chat box. Um, to get started, as many of you know, particularly those of you who are repeat customers, this data call is required under Section 104H1 of the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act. It is designed to provide Treasury with a data set that it will use to periodically analyze, among other things, the effectiveness of the program and the competitiveness of small insurers in the terrorism risk insurance market. <clears throat> State regulators collect similar information for regulatory purposes with respect to the insurers under their supervision. As has been the case for the past few years now, Treasury and State regulators coordinate in this effort with a consolidated approach that will allow reporting insurers, for the most part, to provide the same data set to Treasury through ISO and state regulators through a portal operated by New York State. Um, and as I said before, and again, I'm not an expert on this, but I do understand that uh, the International Department of the NAIC does do some separate collecting uh, as well. So obviously, you need to. Uh, address that. Um, again, uh, when you fill out these forms, 
you know, please upload them to the uh, Veris ISO uh, website. Uh, that gets the information to us. However, you do need to upload, well, the same forms to the New York portal. That gets the information to the state regulator community. Uh, I would note that because of some um, the way the New York portal is set up, it requires some different naming conventions for the actual file that you will upload. So uh, while it's the same document, literally the same information, uh, you'll need to give it a different name uh, when you upload it to the New York portal. And I believe there are instructions uh, in connection with that to, uh, that will tell you what they need. Uh, as I think you also know, the reg there's a regulatory due date for this annual data call of May 15th. Uh, that is set in light of uh, FIO's statutory obligation to provide a report to Congress based on this data by June 30th. Uh, this year, the date is actually May 16th. Uh, lucky everybody, since the 15th falls on a Sunday. So uh, we will be accepting information through the 16th this year. Um, you know, look, we uh, because of we have a pretty tight turnaround for getting that report out, we are not really in a position to provide extensions beyond that May 16th date this year. So please, please do your very best to get the information into it uh, at that time. Um, as has been the case in prior years, we are conducting webinars for each of the four reporting templates that we use. Uh, those are for small insurers, non-small insurers. Those webinars were held yesterday, as well as for alien surplus lines insurers and captive insurers. Uh, this webinar, of course, is addressing alien surplus lines insurers, which for purposes of the data call participate in TRIP by virtue of being listed on the NAI, NAIC's quarterly thing of surplus lines insurers. Now, the alien surplus lines insurer reporting template should only be used by alien surplus lines insurers that are not part of a group unless the group consists only of alien surplus lines insurers. Uh, any alien surplus line insurer that is part of a licensed domestic insurer group should report as part of the group using either the non-small or small insurer template as, as appropriate. Uh, this webinar. So Richard. Will... Yep. Mm -hmm. We we have we have our first question. Okay. Um, and the question is, I have a doubt related to the reporting. My company is an alien and excess surplus insurers, but there's a company of the same group that is American, and we report the information jointly. So we use the small insurance form as the American company, or would we need to use the ENS form? If you are, if, if, if you as this alien surplus lines insurer as, are part of, essentially are affiliated uh, for trip purposes with a small insurer, an entity that classified as a small insurer in the United States, then you get to report your information in, in association with, because all the reporting is on a group basis, you get to report your information in on that um, um, small insurer template, which uh, uh, I'm sure you probably realize by now is preferable since, for you since it actually requires uh, production of somewhat less information. But yes, if uh, again, if you should only be filling out this alien surplus lines company uh, template if you are unaffiliated uh, with any other with any U.S. domestic insurers. Um, and again, we we did we we did uh, hold separate webinars yesterday for the non-small and small insurers. So if you went to uh, uh, take a look at that uh, small insurer uh, webinar for, you know, those particular forms. Obviously, much of it is the same, but there are some differences. Uh, those will hopefully be available on our website next week. Now, uh, this year's data call um, does contain certain changes for alien surplus insurers that write cyber insurance, and it does have um, a new model loss question as well. Um, I should note there's some other changes for captive insurers, which presumably do not really affect this group. Um, 
you will see that the model loss question uses a similar format to those in past years, but applies a new location and new assumptions about the, uh, the attack uh, model. Uh, we will go through the cyber insurance uh, changes and the new model loss question a little later in the webinar. Um, a few more general questions about reporting before we move on to uh, taking a look at these individual worksheets. Um, as I mentioned, TRIP operates on a group basis, so reporting should also be done on a group basis. And again, as we discuss the, um, well, because and again, I, I am not going to, I know that there are some separate issues presented by the reporting you need to do for the International Department of the NAIC. Uh, you know, however, again, that's not something we can address and, and Aaron is not on the call today. So I would suggest if you have any questions about that process that you, you reach out to them. Um, now, following conditions apply for alien share plus uh, insurers for this uh, 2022 data call, you must do either one of two things. Again, if you are affiliated uh, with a larger group that, that reports on either the non-small or small insurer form, your information should be reported on that template. Um, that needs to be separate, uh, submitted separately to both ISO and the New York portal. Um, Second, if the alien surplus lines insurer is not affiliated with a larger group or is part of a group that only contains alien surplus lines insurers, then the alien surplus line insurer should use the alien surplus line template instead. Uh, this form uh, will be submitted to both ISO and to the New York portal. Again, the submissions to ISO and the New York portal are currently due on May 16th in both cases. And again, I think what happens, again, please check me on this because I'm, I'm not the expert on this. I believe that individual alien surplus lines insurers do have an additional reporting requirement for the international insurers department purposes. And I believe you basically have to, con have to complete this template on an individual company basis and submit that to the international department. Again, um, the NAIC folks can address that. Uh, I do suggest you, uh, I, I'm not aware that there's any changes in that process this year, but again, that is not anything we have anything to do with. So uh, please reach out to them if, if you have any questions. Um, the process here that we're, uh, we are addressing is pretty simple. You go to the data collection website, which is www.tripsection111data.com. Uh, and download the registration form. Um, you will then fill out this registration form and email it to the address provided. Uh, the point of contact you list on your registration form will receive an, ISO, an email from ISO with a link to the secure portal. The secure portal will contain your required reporting form. Um, now, we, we do get a, a questions from insurers uh, that they haven't received the reporting template, so uh, again, do remember to, to get the templates, you do have to register each year. So the fact that you may have registered in prior years, that, that doesn't carry over. You do have to separately register uh, each year. So uh, please be mindful of that uh, requirement. And in addition, I can give you a status update from Mike on that. And he advised me this morning that all registrations from alien surplus lines insurers that were received before 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time yesterday, that uh, the, those have been processed and the secure emails containing the uh, SFTP credentials uh, to access the data templates have been sent. So if you did register before 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern yesterday, you should have received your email. Uh, if you if it was after 2 p.m. or you did it today, um, you will necessarily not have probably received your uh, email yet. If you did register uh, before 2 p.m. yesterday and you haven't received the email yet, uh, you, you should probably reach out separately to uh, Veris and ISO um, and Mike McCauley uh, to, to see what might be going on there. 
Um, again, once you have collected your data and completed the reporting form, you do need to send it back to ISO through the same secure portal. Uh, the form is provided to you in Excel format. However, if you do prefer, prefer to report using a CSV form, just notify um, Mike and ISO and they will provide you with the specifications to submit your data in CSV format instead. And again, I can't emphasize this enough, please remember that although this is a consolidated data call with the state regulators, you do need to submit your completed reporting forms to the New York portal separately for state purposes and then submitting submit the form to ISO for treasury purposes. Submitting to one does not um, get the data to the other. Uh, we don't uh, sort of exchange information through that process. Um, and again, as I indicated, because you are following his mail and surplus lines, I'm sure there are, there are other requirements with the international department, which uh, you can uh, address uh, on your own. Now for workers' compensation, with which I, I, I do say this every year, I, it's probably not much of an issue for year for this group. Data for excess workers' compensation policies, which, which I guess may be, gets reported in the same manner as other data elements. Um, if, if you are in that rare circumstance as an alien insurer that has some ability to been licensed to write direct workers' compensation uh, coverage uh, through, uh, in the U.S., that, that information is reported separately to, uh, to ISO by NCCI and certain workers' compensation rating bureaus. Again, probably not applicable to any companies reporting on the alien surplus lines template. However, if you think you uh, may have an issue there about your organization's particular status, uh, please contact either Treasury or ISO. Now, if you have any questions as you collect your data and complete the reporting forms, your first action should be to review the instructions for the small insurer or for the uh, alien surplus uh, lines form that you will be completing. Uh, and I can go back to this here. That instruction form, uh, doing this right, is located on our website, which I've gone back to here. It is right here, and so you can access there. And um, this form basically provides both some general guidelines and guidance, as well as literally going through each data cell on the worksheets and provides you know, some further information on, you know, what it is we're looking for to the extent you've got any, any questions. So, uh, you know, if you do have any questions, really looking at the instructions or the, is the first um, um, uh, source of information. Uh, we do also have a document on the Treasury website at the same location. Uh, it's a sample fact patterns document, which, uh, uh, is available for reference purposes. We also do have a zip code listing for that, that may be helpful to you for the geographic exposures worksheet. Uh, those can be accessed there. Um, I should note that the fat sample fact patterns uh, sheet is on uh, is done on the uh, non-small insurer template, which certainly looks somewhat different from the form that the alien surplus lines insurers uh, fill out, but the, the principles underlying it are the same. So if you have any, you know, it, it may be worth a look if you have some um, uh, questions about how that uh, should be done. Um, let's see. Again, if you still have, let me go back to the one now. If you still have uh, questions after reviewing this, the instructions and look at these materials, you can obtain help in response to a specific question by emailing trip section 111 data at iso.com. In response to this email, you'll get either a written response, written email response, or a call from ISO or a call for Treasury. And as uh, Sherry mentioned earlier in the chat, you do have in the chat uh, uh, box uh, uh, information to uh, reach all of us directly if you want to do that. And, and please do so if you uh, have a question. All right, at this point, um, 
I'm going to walk through each of the individual worksheets within the Alien Surplus Lines Insurer template to provide explanations as to what we are seeking and some suggestions for completing uh, the worksheet. Again, as I go through this, if you have any questions, you can uh, direct them in the chat box to Sherry. If you do that, she will see them. No one else will. Obviously, if you want to send them to everybody, that's fine, but sending them to her, uh, you, you, you will retain some level of anonymity if you care about that. Um, so again, I will try to address as many of those as I can while we're going through the forms, and otherwise there'll be at least some time at the end of the presentation to address any questions at that point. Um, now, once you've submitted your registration and get your forms, those will actually be live Excel spreadsheets or at least the specifications for CVS, uh, CSV um, uh, uh, reporting. For today's webinar, uh, I'm just going to be showing you the PDF versions of the standard reporting form. It's a little easier uh, to manipulate that as we, as we go through this. Uh, just keep in mind that the individual Excel sheets you, you will receive may, may appear slightly different. Okay, this first sheet that is now up on the screen is for insurer group affiliations. The purpose of this worksheet is to really just identify what entities you are reporting for. Again, reporting is done on a group basis unless, obviously, you are a single company that isn't affiliated with another uh, group. And again, you should be listing alien surplus lines insurers only here. If you attempt to list any admitted companies, again, you should be essentially reporting in your experience on either the non-small or the small insurer template instead. Um, we ask you to provide the number assigned uh, for, for the numbers uh, up here for identification purposes. Uh, please use the number assigned by the IID for tracking purposes. Um, if you are an insurer that does not have such a number for whatever reason, uh, ISO does assign numbers to companies each year for tracking purposes. If you have reported before, you should use the same company identification numbers that you have used in prior years. Now, in column G, uh, in, well, column G and H, you'll see you need to report the group's total 2020 policyholder surplus using the same number that you know would be reported for state purposes. You also need to um, report the 2020 uh, trip eligible lines premium, as this number is used to calculate your 2020 program deductible, and you actually need to use that sheet when you. Uh, answer, respond to questions on the reinsurance worksheet, in particular in connection with the model loss question. Um, if you actually re and again, just for everybody's, just make sure we're all on the same page. This is the 2022 data call. It is seeking information generally on uh, calendar year 2021. However, because of the way TRIP is set up in calendar year 2021, your deductible for TRIP purposes, if you ever do need to make a claim, uh, would have been based upon your 2020 trip eligible lines DEP. So for analytical purposes, we that is why we're asking for those 2020 figures in this particular field. So I just wanted to make sure everybody realized that wasn't a typo. We you will see once we get past here, we are I think pretty much exclusively looking at uh, looking for 2021 um, information. Okay, um, that's pretty much all there is on that one. Uh, on the next page is the premium worksheet. On the next, on this sheet, you will be reporting your direct earned premium and policy count. Now we add, and this is the principal significant difference for alien surplus lines insurers that report solely as alien surplus lines insurers. We do it. We um, we, well, we, we, we allow alien surplus lines insurers to report here using the same line descriptions that they use would use for uh, Solvency II purposes, uh, even though TRIP is otherwise managed with reference to NAIC state reporting lines. Um, so that's the, the, uh, the numbers here. When we started this, uh, certainly the information was conveyed to us that if at all possible, if alien insurers were able to report using those solvency two categories that made the reporting easier for them um, uh, than would be otherwise to uh, convert it to NAIC lines. 
again, if you are reporting in association with um, a, a small or non-small domestic insurer, you will have to do that there. But if you are um, reporting solely on an alien surplus lines insurer basis, uh, you can use uh, those categorizations. Um, now, uh, keep in mind that, again, how much this is relevant to, to you guys is, you know, you'll have to figure out. There are some differences in how trip uh, premium gets reported as it might be reported for state purposes otherwise. Uh, no personal lines premium should be reported on this sheet. Uh, trip is based solely on commercial lines of insurance. Some of the NAIC reporting lines, I'm thinking fire and um, uh, allied lines, do contain some elements of personal lines premium. That should not be included. If you have any personal lines of premium that you would other classify under these uh, categories, that should not be reported here. Uh, similarly, uh, um, and I guess you would probably report it under general li liability on this form, professional liability and errors and omissions coverage, with the exception of D&O coverage, are excluded from TRIP. So if you've got any premium that you would otherwise uh, slot under general liability, that should not be included here because that is um, uh, not report that is not eligible for trip purposes. So long story short, there might be amounts that you report under these solvency two lines, but you would not do here. Uh, please look at the instructions uh, which which try which do detail this in terms of what the differences are to make sure that uh, you are being accurate. If you have reported before, there are no changes in this re re regard. So if you have been doing it correctly, uh, please keep doing it as you've been doing it in uh, prior years. Now, going back to the form itself, uh, column D, uh, which is ends up being your total 2021 trip eligible DEP, this column, that will auto-populate and will be based on the sums of column E, F, and G, uh, which break down your policies based upon whether terrorism risk coverage was declined, whether it was provided for column E, whether it was provided for no cost, or whether it was provided for some um, uh, disclosed amount of premium. If you do provide a number uh, in column G where terrorism risk insurance coverage is provided for a disclosed premium, then column H um, there should contain the actual amount that was charged for terrorism risk insurance premium. And thus column H will be a subset of column G, which shows the overall premium for that policy. Premium should be entered on a direct earned basis for calendar year 2021. That's not a direct written basis. Um, TRIP is set up based on a direct earned premium basis. This, of course, means that if you have a policy that started before 2021 or ended after 2021, you should only include the premium earned for that during 2021 for that policy. If the policy covers uh, multiple states, that should be allocated to each state uh, proportionally, in the same manner as you report that would report for state purposes. And again, I, I do appreciate that. Uh, Again, for the, the multi, any multi-state reporting, alien surplus lines insurers are essentially allowed here for the most part to report as they report for state purposes. So if by virtue of being an alien surplus lines insurer, you don't uh, have to report uh, uh, individually on individual states, you can uh, basically report just to the states that you are uh, allowed to report to for those purposes. All right, policy count uh, is set forth in columns I, J, and K. And as with premium, uh, you will divide the policies based on whether terrorism risk coverage was declined, included for no cost, or included for some amount of premium. These amounts will automatically add up and appear in column L. Uh, keep in mind that your policy count will be calculated differently than the premium. Essentially, a policy should be counted if it incepted at any time in 2021, or if it incepted before 2021, but remained in effect on December 31, 2021. If you had a policy that started on January, 9, January 1, 2019, and ended on December 31, 2021, 
you would include the policy in your policy count as, as a one. Similarly, if you had a policy that began on July 1, 2020 and ended on December 31, uh, 2021, you would also include that policy in your policy count. But if your policy began on July 1, 2020, but expired on June 30th, 2021, the policy should not be included in the policy count because the policy neither accepted in 2021 nor was in effect on December 31, 2021. And as I note, uh, should note, and we had this question yesterday, even though you're putting in a zero for that particular policy, that was in effect for six months during 2021, you would be reporting that six months worth of earned premium associated with that policy. Um, you know, we, we appreciate there's some disconnect there, but uh, we, we came up with this way of coming up which what, with what we thought would be the best way of getting a relatively consistent policy count year over year uh, on these uh, issues. I do want to highlight that if any of you have policies that cover multiple lines of insurance, you will end up with some double counting for those policies because you should be counting the policy one time for each line of insurance where it appears. So, uh, you know, uh, just, well, I'm not exactly sure how, whether that really would come up, but just say, for example, you had a fo policy that covered that fire and damage to property line and also had some L, uh, general liability elements in there, um, you would record a policy count in both lines 10 and rows 10 and 11. You would see that if you add these numbers vertically, you'll get the double counting of the policy because the uh, horizontal uh, count for that uh, policy line should still be accurate. Um, beyond this, you are going to uh, ensure that each policy then does get uh, addressed on each state worksheet that you may be required to fill out. However, for this same policy that covers multiple lines here, that line 10 and 11, there we're asking you on line 14 to just put in a one for that policy. So that'll give us a little better idea of if you are issuing uh, policies with multiple lines of insurance. Uh, uh, and that'll that'll sort of alert us to that double counting issue there. So that's all I have for that one. Moving on to the next page, which is the standalone terrorism uh, worksheet. This asks you to provide information about any standalone policies that you have which cover terrorism. This is going to cover policies that offer coverage only for terrorism risk. Other policies would only be included on the previous page for reporting direct earned premium. However, if you do, if you are engaging in issuing standalone terrorism policies, those policies, the premium associated for those would also be reported as well as the policy count numbers in that uh, uh, prior worksheet. This would essentially be a subset of what is otherwise reported under that worksheet, just so we can get an idea of what the picture is for uh, standalone uh, terrorism. Uh, for comparative purposes, we are asking you for information on policies that provide coverage for acts of terrorism certified under TRIA, that's uh, line four, as well as policies to provide coverage for other acts of terrorism uh, that are not subject uh, to, tr to TRIA. Um, again, we do this for comparative purposes just so we have an understanding of what's going on in the market in that regard. Data on this sheet is reported solely on a nationwide basis. Um, and again, in addition to DEP, you will need to provide data on the number of policies issued and information on the exposure and limits of, of liability. All right, the next page is the cyber worksheet. And this is the one that contains the principal changes for purposes of this year. So I will be uh, trying to go over that in some detail. Um, the information, um, so while the categories of information have expanded, we are continuing to seek the information both on standalone cyber policies, that, that's the information that's reported in column C, as well as cyber endorsements attached to another policy or, or package, part of a package policy, that experience should be reported in column D. You should not, uh, if, if you still have 
uh, these risks should not provide any information on so-called non-affirmative or silent cyber coverage, where a policy may cover some sort of cyber loss because cyber is not specifically excluded in the policy. Now, going to this particular expanded form, lines uh, three through six, that's right there, uh, eight to nine, and 18 to 19, uh, request information concerning premium, number of policies, and limits for cyber policies in TRIP eligible lines of insurance that has been requested previously and is continuing to be requested. So you should continue to respond to these questions as you have in the past. Um, lines, let's see, seven. Uh, 10 and 20 request the same information concerning premium number of policies and limits, but as applied to cyber, cyber policies written in non-TRIP eligible lines of insurance. Now, I'm not sure how much of an issue this is with this group. Uh, it is more of an issue with uh, folks that are writing domestically and, uh, you know, coding this coding their policies as professional liability insurance. Uh, professional liability insurance and E&O insurance is subject to a express exclusion under TRIA. We do not, cannot cover those policies uh, and in the past have not you know, requested any information on them. Um, you know, uh, if, so, and I'm not sure how much alien surplus lines insurers are doing that. However, if you, haven't been reporting some amount of cyber, direct cyber insurance, standalone or on a package basis in the past, based upon an assessment that you are writing this as part of a, a risk that is not within the coverage of the program. We're now asking you to report that experience in these, uh, in these questions on the non-TRIP eligible lines. Again, we are trying to get a better feel for what's going on in the market on this. Um, and that, that is why we're asking that information. So it's the same information as we've asked in the past, uh, but it is asking it for potentially for lines of insurance that perhaps you weren't reporting to us before. If generally alien surplus lines insurers have been reporting all that to us before, then fine, you'll, you'll be entering zeros there. But again, we are now looking really, you know, in terms of this template for the total aggregation of your cyber writings and, you know, whether they either fall within TRIP or currently outside of it. Now, there are three categories of information that are being requested this year that have never been requested in the prior TRIP data calls. These start at lines 12 to 17. Uh, premium and number of employees allocated by size of policyholder measured by its number of employees. Lines uh, 21, bear with me, 21 through 24, and that's limits specific to cyber extortion and to ransom payments specifically. And last but not least, on the next page of this, lines 25, 30, uh, loss information specific to cyber extortion and ransom payments. Now, um, I'm going to pivot back to the instructions um, for this. And we have included uh, a box, special instructions box or part on uh, page three of this. As you'll see in the first bullet under these special instructions, uh, it basically identifies what, what we consider to be this sort of totally new information. Um, uh, but it also provides what uh, our, our um, feelings on, on how companies should be completing it. As we were proposing this, we certainly did get some comments to the effect that some insurers, um, particularly on the number of employees uh, for policyholders, uh, metric had not been uh, collecting this information either 
consistently or, well, either at all or consistently in calendar year 2021 and, and simply didn't capture it so it can't be captured by their systems. Um, look, if you did not capture it in 2021, we are, we are not purporting to require you to go out and do some sort of retrospective analysis of, of, your, poli of your policyholders to respond to this. Uh, um, Again, this is we, we believe this is based upon if you, your existing capabilities don't permit you to do that, you, you are not requiring you to do that. Uh, we are basing that on the essentially the same test uh, that you provide information to us generally, which is that it is a full and true statement of the information uh, provided to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief. Um, if, if you can't do that because of those sort of limitations, um, we get that. Uh, we do uh, expect and, and wish that uh, for calendar year 2021 or 2022, next year's data call, you should be collecting that now so that we can, uh, we would be able to address that next year. But if you are unable to address that this year, um, you know, we get that. If, if you have the information but feel you may fall into some uh, unusual situation, look, give us a call. Uh, we can address individual situations individually. We do want you to do your best on this if you can. Uh, we actually had a question on um, yesterday, one of yesterday's webinars that uh, an insurer basically was able to say that while they, they didn't really collect it as such, they basically knew as a matter of certainty that uh, all of their cyber uh, premium numbers, what have you, fell into a, one of those particular buckets. So obviously, if you can respond on that sort of basis with a you know good best estimate, uh, we're fine with that. Um, again, if you know you simply didn't didn't collect it and thus don't have that kind of uh, window into what you were writing in that regard, um, you know we we understand that issue. Uh, we would actually assume, frankly, that on the other new elements, limits, and um, uh, loss history, uh, that, that would seem to us to be information that insurers would, would generally collect. So we would be, frankly, a little more skeptical about you not having that. But uh, in any event, uh, you know, if you have any questions on that that you need to address with us individually, we can do that. Now, on this new information premium, uh, number of policies allocated by size of the policy holder, um, that's requesting for all, we're not uh, purporting to break that out between any trip or non-trip um, um, lines issues there, uh, just for all of your cyber policies in general. These are the same size categories that were utilized by the NAIC for the business interruption data calls that it did uh, in association with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, not sure if any of, of you folks needed to respond to that, but but they're the same buckets that were used for that. And again, it's pretty obvious we're, we're trying to get an idea of sort of small, medium, and large size entities that are uh, accessing uh, cyber insurance. Again, if you have the information uh, available, we would assume the reporting should be pretty straightforward. But again, we can respond to individual questions as necessary. Now, regarding the new information concerning limit-specific cyber extortion and ransom payments, the distinction we are drawing is between coverage for cyber extortion generally, uh, that is, you know, if your policy covers a ransomware attack, we appreciate that you know, policies may provide coverage for a wide range of benefits, which are certainly far beyond simply the amount of money that the bad actor is trying to extort out of the policyholder. That would be the sort of general cyber extortion category. For ransom payments, uh, that is we're trying to get a, a handle on the actual limit for that you would have available for the actual uh, payment itself, payment or reimbursement. We understand many insurers do not pay that directly as opposed to reimburse the policyholder for it. Um, look, if you don't, uh, we're trying to get at whether there are any sublimits applicable to either of these categories. Uh, uh, if there are not, and your policy basically has one limit that, you know, it's a one size fits all, the same that you issued a million dollar cyber policy and has a million dollar limit for the ransom, for the any associated 
uh, other associated loss, any other cyber events, um, you would just uh, basically report the same limit in each of those categories. Um, if that limit changes depending upon the characterizations we're identifying here, that's what we're trying to get at. Um, and here, the information is being requested separately as between policies in the TRIP versus non-TRIP eligible lines if you are reporting separately in that regard um, you know, for, uh, for the reasons we talked about before. Finally, the last category, loss information specific to cyber extortion and ransomware payments. Here, we are requesting it for all cyber policies combined, whether in TRIP eligible lines or not. The questions seek paid and incurred amounts for cyber extortion generally and paid amounts for the actual ransom payment along with the number of claims such ransom payments are associated with. So, you know, uh, probably no huge mystery here. We would like to get a number which these the amounts of payments uh, that, are, that have gone to the bad actors and the number of claims that um, uh, that uh, is for will get a per per claim amount that's being paid for ransom at this point. Um, finally, direct defense amounts for cyber extortion generally. Uh, and again, here we're not seeking you to try to segregate that with the ransom payment, uh, uh, of course. Those are sought on both a paid and incurred basis for uh, 2021. Uh, we appreciate the question. Okay. Question is, what should be what should be done if a company part of a group does not have the cyber info, but the other company of the group does have it? Should we report in part or not at all? Well, if, if you're doing group reporting, I mean, you know, I mean, we, we do group reporting because that's how TRIP is set up. At the end of the day, if, if we ever uh, open this program up and you make claims, you basically make claims as part of a group and pay a group deductible. That is why the reporting is on a group basis. Um, I mean, look, we don't see what companies do. Uh, we can't see behind the curtain as to how companies put their reporting together. Uh, I, I have had conversations with insurers that obviously we know you've got multiple data systems here and there, and you know that that needs to essentially be all merged together and you know, at the end of the day needs to be reported into us on a consolidated basis. So, you know, my understanding is that the companies, you know, typically they, they, they do that coordination internally to make sure they can get all of the relevant data in one place. And then it gets, you know, loaded up in the spreadsheet and reported to us. So, I mean, how you do that, that is, you know, your business, obviously. I mean, we are just looking for the uh, consolidated group group formation for your group. Now, if again, because I do know that alien surplus lines insurers ultimately may may need to do that report separately for each of them for the NAIC IID purposes. Uh, that that's between you and the NAIC. I, I can't really advise you on that. Um, so, in any event, we appreciate there's a lot of new information here. We do believe these are all concepts which uh, insurers writing in the cyberspace should be very cognizant of this at this point. Obviously, if you don't write cyber insurance, uh, it's your lucky day. You don't have any uh, uh, data, data production environments in this regard. Um, you know, again, we can respond to further questions at the end of the prayer remarks on this or Again, if you prefer to speak with us uh, uh, directly on an individual basis uh, offline, uh, we can do that as well. All right, I am now going to go back to our um, circle of signs insurer form. And let's go to the next one, that's the cyber form. Okay. And this is the exposures uh, worksheet. Uh, again, this is done on a jurisdictional basis, so it should be done the same way as you report your premium. And again, it is set up based on the Solvency II reporting line. You are asked here to identify 
and exposures, we're really we're looking for limits, property limits, as well as liability limits. There are uh, information for reporting of payroll associated with workers' compensation, but again, that's probably not a big issue for many of the folks on this call. Um, and again, we're, we're looking for those exposures uh, where terrorism coverage was provided or not. Uh, the purpose here is to calculate the total potential exposure under the policies. In other words, the most that you might have to pay under the policy in question. This worksheet asks you to specif specifically identify policy limits where nuclear, biological, chemical, ra or radiological resist risks or NDCR risks are not excluded. That is uh, in column E. So generally, column D, basically you're providing terrorism risk insurance. Column E is basically the subset of the limits in column D where you are not totally excluding NBCR risks uh, from the policy. So if you had sublimits there, those would come in there if you only provide some. Keep in mind also when we say not totally excluded, uh, if you have, for example, a nuclear exclusion in your policy, but your policy would cover um, um, you know, chemical or radiological risks, go ahead and code that as it does not exclude NBCR risks. We determined not to try to divide that out before those four categories as being too difficult. So uh, we appreciate that some of the amount you report in there may exclude some amount of NBCR risk, but if it includes any NBCR risk, uh, you should report it there. Uh, and again, column E, you're not, uh, uh, oh, column uh, F is for the deductibles for your policyholder on that. Again, those would be deductibles to the extent it's a primary level policy. You're providing excess. We don't want you basically providing a lot of deductibles, which are going to be reported by somebody else and hence a lot of double counting. Uh, column H, uh, that's if Coverage is declined. Obviously, not everybody gets terrorism coverage, but we want to see what those limits are. And again, the same um, figure on deductibles. And then on starting on column I, basically the same uh, series of questions for liability, terrorism risk coverage provided, terrorism risk coverage provided in NBCR not excluded, um, policyholder deductible, and then where it's declined and then the policyholder deductible for that. Um, keep in mind as well that when you're when you're doing the uh, the MDCR um, uh, assessment, uh, obviously we're aware that in some states in the US there are so-called fire following uh, uh, laws that uh, require coverage uh, no matter what a policy says for a fire law, if you're providing coverage pursuant for a fire law. So I'm not really sure that's much of an issue for the folks in this group. I think it's limited uh, to if you write on the so-called standard fire policy in the US, which I think is an admitted coverage thing as opposed to surplus lines. But uh, the bottom line is don't pay any attention to that. Please respond based upon what your policies say regarding NBCR as distinguished from uh, any other legal requirements that might affect that. And as I said, we, we, we've gone over the issue on the deductibles of your policyholders. Again, if you're at the primary layer on that. Um, uh, this one, you know, we're, we're requesting you report on a jurisdictional basis for where you report jurisdictionally, but there is a, there will be a subset on uh, the United States for this. So, uh, on there, um, you know, use basically don't aggregate things on policies that cover multiple jurisdictions, just aggregate it all for the United States uh, as a whole. Uh, uh, this is a point when you do report deductibles. If, if you've got a policy that might have multiple deductibles, depending upon the property or operation uh, going on, uh, use the lowest one uh, when figuring that out. Uh, but, you know, we had to come up with some conventional analysis that uh, we do. Now, other sort of hints on how the exposure information should be reported as compared to premium. Uh, first of all, you would want to report the exposure information on a per occurrence basis. Uh, next, whereas you divide premium information proportionally by jurisdiction, with exposure, you know, 
report, you report the relevant limit for each jurisdiction, even if an aggregate limit might cap your uh, exposure across multiple jurisdictions. So for example, if you had a policy providing a million dollars of coverage in two states, say California and Oregon, uh, you would report a million dollar exposure on each of the California and Oregon worksheets, uh, even though uh, each, the policy had a single overall limit of a million. Um, again, you need to fill out the general U.S. worksheet as well, which would you know, aggregate that experience. So there you would just uh, fill out the million for that particular policy. Uh, also, as a reminder, um, if, the, if there is no per occurrence or single occurrence limit, in the policy, uh, use the policy's aggregate limit for that. And I think we otherwise, if it's a policy that's based upon a, a property policy that's based on prop, uh, insured values, then obviously just uh, use the insured values instead. Um, another uh, difference between the DEP spreadsheet and this exposure spreadsheet is here, we are asking you to basically do a snapshot of the exposure based upon the policies that were in force on December 31, 2021. This does differ from the premium worksheet, which actually asks you to include all premium earned in 2021, even if a policy expired before December 31, 2020, uh, December 31. So again, on the exposure worksheet uh, only, if a policy terminated for December 31, 2021, uh, you should not include that policy in your calculation. Again, the, pre, the, the uh, payroll information uh, down in column N, if you actually wrote real workers' compensation, that would be uh, provided by the rating uh, bureaus. However, uh, for excess workers' compensation, you would need to fill that in. Okay, moving to the next sheet. This is the policyholder industry code. This is, again is a nationwide worksheet, uh, doesn't, not based on jurisdictions. On this page, you categorize premium for your policy using your choice of NAICS codes or SIC codes, or you can, also, uh, yeah, NAIC or SIC codes. You will be providing data for property and liability policies, and once again, dividing these based upon whether coverage was provided or not. Uh, you will see there is an unavailable option uh, down there and down there. Um, uh, there this isn't, a, uh, it's not like uh, we don't want you to report everything in this field. We do recognize that some data just reasonably does not get captured uh, with respect to this level of detail due to maybe data changes or system changes over a year does give you the option to report that information there. Um, so again, and then again, like the other ones, if you do write uh, excess workers uh, compensation, uh, that would get uh, reported here as well. Uh, going on to the next sheet, this is the places of worship uh, template. This form collects data on the availability and affordability of terrorism risk insurance for places of worship. Um, again, this started up, I guess, in the 2020 data call. The worksheet remains the same this year. It is requesting that data be reported on a nationwide basis and categorized by property, liability, and workers' compensation policies. We only want information on policies written for places of worship. Uh, when you are reporting this data, please, in you know, churches, mosques, synagogues, that sort of thing. Uh, when you're reporting this data, please do your best only to report coverage related to actual houses of worship and exclude any affiliated religious organizations such as hospitals or schools. Um, I mean, we are, if, if you have, you know, appropriately uh, uh, categorized your uh, premium by these uh, NAICS and SIC codes as well, or the ISO codes, if you've got those in there, that should approximate that. So we're fine with you using that. Uh, but again, try to keep out of there things like hospitals or schools, because that's going to generate a lot of extra premium that really isn't the subject to this inquiry. Um, so if you can use one of those reporting systems, please do. And of course, you only need to use one. So you don't need to report it in on each line. Um, if you 
if you can't, but you have some other way to extract this data, such as a policyholder name search, you can do that instead. Uh, you will see there is no category for unavailable or unknown here, because we are we do need specific data on this for places of worship given a congressional requirement. So we do ask that you find a way to actually report the data or estimate the information for your policyholders that are within this uh, category. Okay, going to the next sheet, this is the geographic exposures worksheet. Um, you can view this sheet as requesting about that. Uh, you can view this sheet as requesting the same sort of information that AMBEST asks for on its terrorism questionnaire. The geographic descriptions are the same as those used by AMBEST. In addition to help reporting, as I mentioned earlier, we have a compiled we have compiled a complete list of zip codes for each jurisdiction on the worksheet where the description, uh, so for example, up here, all zip codes within the four counties of Fulton, DeKalb, Clay, uh, Clayton, and Cobb, uh, you can find that list of zip codes on our website if it's easier for you to get to the information uh, that way. Uh, then that can be downloaded as an Excel file from our website if you find it helpful to respond to the question. Um, otherwise, you know, use your best approximation of these geographic areas. Uh, this worksheet does ask for data on excess workers' compensation policies that you provide. You'll see that's in column E. Now, on the next page, we are asking about aggregations within specific zip codes to see which zip codes in the U.S. have the highest rates of aggregation. So you would add up all the exposures in zip codes and provide your top five zip codes in order. Uh, you will see we ask you to do this twice. The first set is for the defined geographic areas of the, uh, of the metropolitan areas that are identified in the, in the prior two pages. And then, uh, Basically, uh, this is for the second part of it is for basically the, the rest of the United States. And last but not least, on lines 49 and 50, we ask you for your highest single exposure at a particular location. Here, you would be focusing on one particular location and providing exposure amounts and the zip code of that location. Uh, as opposed to these previous sets of questions where you were basically providing an accumulation of risks of all locations within a particular zip. Again, this, this form has not uh, changed in prior years. The, you know, the reporting we've gotten on this, uh, it seems to be pretty consistent. So no changes. Uh, please continue to report as you've been doing. And again, if you have any questions, we can address them. Now, last but not least is the, reins oops, sorry, is the reinsurance worksheet. Um, you will need to answer these questions for your private third-party reinsurance protection. You should not include any intra-company arrangements that you may have in place. So it doesn't matter to, oh, we understand you may have those for various capitalization and financial reasons. That's not of interest to us. We're really looking uh, at the, um, you know, whatever reinsurance you've gotten uh, on a third-party basis. And, and we should, I would note as well, it's treaty reinsurance. Obviously, we're, we appreciate you have many, many multiple um, separate facultative arrangements in place for particular policies or programs. We are not purporting uh, to have you respond on that. We are really looking for the treaty experience that you have to get a more general feel on what your general reinsurance um, experience is. Uh, we strongly recommend that if you have an individual responsible for reinsurance in your company, you should forward this worksheet to them for completion. This will help ensure the accuracy of the data we receive. And now in addition, in column C, which is where, where you know, uh, your response is, and I, this, I really want to emphasize this. When responding to this worksheet, we really need you to put real numbers in this column. We understand that in complex reinsurance programs, it may be difficult to provide a single answer. But if a response is provided uh, as an, you know, see addendum or see attachment, 
um, or you just don't put anything in because you know you you really don't think you can come up with a a single number. We're just not in a position to aggregate it or assess it at that point. We are looking for you to put in, you know, your best number for your, you know, either your your correct or your most likely number that would go into that column based upon what your experience is. Again, do your best to get a number in there because if you don't, it makes us scratch our heads pretty much. Um, as uh, so, again, if you have any questions about this. Uh, you can direct them directly to us or to, to, to Mike and Polly at ISO. Um, I'll point out we, we do uh, ask for uh, ask questions in here on nat natural catastrophe reinsurance purchases. We do get questions on that and sort of ask why we're doing it. We do it for comparison purposes so we can see how terrorism risk reinsurance compares with you know what you're able to get for nat cat purposes. Um, at the bottom. Uh, Line, uh, line 26, uh, uh, there's a sort of other, reins other reinsurance exclusion, specifically a trip you did to trip certified uh, acts of terrorism. Uh, it's meant to capture situations that exclude risks at particular locations or within certain metropolitan areas. All right, uh, the end. Finally, is the model loss question. Again, the format uh, has not changed. Uh, it is looking, it is seeking a model loss response on both uh, property and workers' compensation uh, risk exposures, not liability. Uh, this scenario uh, in focuses on a location in downtown Miami, Florida. It involves a single truck bomb blast at a street intersection with uh, GPS specific GPS coordinates are identified in the scenario description if you need those. Um, we want you to determine the total losses you would experience under your policies, if any, associated with this exposure. And there were, uh, we're talking about policies that provide terrorism risk. You have policyholders that did not purchase terrorism risk insurance. You could ignore them for purposes of this. What we're asking you is to identify the, the portfolio of policies you have that could respond to a loss associated with this. And then we're basically going to ask you to calculate what that total loss is and then how that gets allocated well, first with against your policyholder. We want you to tell us that. Obviously, most carriers aren't paying, you know, providing dollar one coverage on this. And then to take the balance and allocate it as it would be allocated if there was a claim under the terrorism risk insurance program. Um, of course, if you don't have any policyholders who you calculate would be effective, you can enter zeros in each field and, and you're done with this. Now, looking at the place where you actually put in the data, so ultimately we're asking you, line 30 will auto-populate, and basically we're asking you, once you figure out that portfolio of policies and what the total exposure arising under them would be, uh, actually go ahead and start by allocating it. So give us what your insurance deductible is, or retention. Um, the net, well, and again, we're there, we're, we're looking for only put that in if you're the carrier directly sitting above the deductible or retention. If you're an excess carrier that your coverage doesn't trigger until you know there's an exhaustion of underlying coverage, uh, don't put that in because, you know, that should be essentially entered by other companies before you. We only want the company that's basically directly above the insured retention or deductible to put in that number because otherwise we'd be overstating what the policyholders are being asked to pay for because multiple people would be reporting. Once you factored that out, uh, so uh, or figured out what the, the, the policyholder pays, the next step is you need to, uh, before you get to a claim against the government, you need to calculate how much you pay in, the, in your deductible. And again, that's that 20% of your prior year, of your 2020 DEP. So whatever that figure is, we're asking you to, and that figure should add up, whatever that figure is should add up to the total of what's in 32 and 33. Uh, I mean, assuming you exhaust that deductible, um, that would be both the net amount you pay, which is net of any 
uh, private reinsurance you have. And of course, if you've got some private reinsurance that would respond, we'd ask you to put that in uh, line 33. Next, once you uh, uh, deducted out the policyholders' uh, uh, exposure as well as your deductible, if you've still got loss above that, you have a claim under TRIP for 80% of the balance of that. That figure should be entered into uh, line 34. Um, in addition to the, if you are through your deductible, um, and obviously if you don't get through your deductible, I mean, report the information. We're obviously interested to the extent the losses are only falling in the deductible. Report, you know, what you, what you do feel would go through the deductible, even if it doesn't exhaust it. Uh, if you have exhausted the deductible, you have the 80% figure of the balance in line 34. That would be the government share. And then there's a 20% remaining copay share that you would then pay either on a, a net basis, if you don't have reinsurance for it, or on a, um, um, if you've reinsured it, then, you know, you would put, put it in the last line, column 36. So again, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, and 36 will add up. Once you figured out the policies exposed here and what the total loss is, uh, that's the number that, um, that ends up in uh, line 30. So a um, couple other points of clarification. You'll see the scenario includes estimated numbers for employee injuries. It doesn't, again, it doesn't ask you to estimate any potential liability exposure. So only property and workers comp, and that, that employee number is a, sort of our estimate of a total uh, worker loss associated with this event. You should sort of try to figure out if, if you do have any uh, workers comp exposure, and that may not be the case with this group, try to do a sort of proportional assessment of your exposure for that, that group. And with that, I think that's all that I have. Um, Sherry, I, I assume there are no more questions that have come in since the last one you posed? Right, I have not received any more questions. Okay, I'll, I'll sort of hold it open if anybody wants to type furiously and uh, have anything else to put in. Uh, we, we can stay here for a minute. Again, we are go we are recording this. I'll I'll turn the recording off in a minute, pending possible future questions. But uh, we we will get that posted on our website. Um, and uh, let me make sure I don't have any questions here. Uh, I think uh, the only ones. I see in here. I think we've responded to everything that's come in so far. Jerry, nothing further on your end? Nothing further. Okay. Well, again, I thank everybody for taking the time today and certainly for uh, the effort on this. It, it is very important to us. And, you know, we do issue a report every year. This is the, uh, the year where we do a general report on the effectiveness of the program. So we wouldn't be able to do that without um, – the help you guys uh, provide on this, which is governmentally required. So <laughs> we, we appreciate it's not voluntary, but uh, you know we do appreciate uh, all your efforts. And if there's anything we can do to help you on this, uh, please, we'd rather you uh, ask us the question than scratch, scratch your head and, and worry about it. So um, again, I'm going to turn the recording off now and, uh, and sign off. Uh, have a good rest of the day.